because he doesn't have audio. So, yeah. All right. I'm sure he's figured it out now. I hope. Lights on the camera. Go? Yeah, he's yeah. good. All right, great. All right, well, welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our first facilities <coughs> committee meeting of our, of our new year. Um, I'm Chris Haggerty, I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, we have our brand new roster, our new lineup here for facilities. Uh, Mr. Sam Hershey, Ms. Lynn Edmonds, Ms. Cheryl Caulfield are our committee members. Uh, Mr. Hershey is our vice chair, and we'll be leaning on him heavily as we go forward. Um, what I'd like to do really quick is on our agenda, we have a few moments for a few comments. You can take a look at the agenda for review and then we will go forward uh, approving the meeting minutes. I know for some of you, uh, you will be taking our word for it because you were not here at our previous meeting. But I hope Lindsay or maybe you know, as a veteran board member will vouch that these <coughs> are the minutes of what actually happened. So. Um, Facilities Committee, for those of you who haven't attended before as a member or who might be watching for the first time, this is where we talk about not just uh, what we build, where we build it, when we build it, but we also talk about the how and the why. And so we'll be covering all aspects of that going forward and several other issues related to the facilities we use to not only educate our children but also uh, run and administer the business of the district. So there's uh, a lot of exciting issues. It's not just uh, limited to construction. We will talk about facilities utilization, things that impact assignment. We'll talk about policy issues related to how we build and where we build and um, a lot of exciting stuff. So I thought real quick we'd go around and if our committee members or our other uh, <coughs> visiting members are joining us, just want to just take a minute or two, introduce kind of like what you're interested in in facilities or what you might want to cover. So you're putting us on the spot right away. Well, you should know this because <laughs> we talked about the agenda. So if anyone here had a fair warning, it was you. Uh, no, I just... Um, I love the idea. I love being in our schools, seeing what they need. I, I am immediately impressed with uh, Mark and Douglas and the team and the work that they're doing. And I wish we had all the money in the world to <coughs> use, to give them, to get everything done uh, tomorrow. But um, I'm looking forward to working with them. We have top-notch professionals in Wake County. We are really lucky and fortunate to, uh, to have them. Fantastic. Ms. Edmonds? Uh, Lynn Edmonds, District 5, and um, I had a particular interest in facilities committee and serving on the committee because Swift Creek is in my district, which we're getting ready to um, level and rebuild. And uh, Washington Elementary and Athens <laughs> Drive were on the bond that we just passed. So those two are of particular interest to me. Excellent issues and things that we will be covering. I hope so. <laughs> All right, thanks. Mr. Swanson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to join you all today. Um, similar to Ms. Evans' point, just looking at some of the schools in District 9 that you know have some needs, some very heavy, heavy needs, and finding ways to bring those needs to the table. Um, a couple of schools in particular, but I don't want to name them without showing love to all the schools, but it's good, some of the interests that I have, so thank you. Ms. Caulfield. Cheryl Caulfield for District 1. Um, I don't really have anything to add of why for the facilities. Um, so I was assigned to it, and I, I do want to, I have been going around going to all the different schools, seeing what the different needs are. Very different for every school. Um, you know, I, I've gone from even the elementary schools, we have one that, you know, they may have structural issues, and then you have others that uh, could be design, you know, concerns that they have. And just seeing how we could work with the different schools and help them and get what they need. Sounds great. Okay, thank you. Chair Mahaffey, any comments? All right, wonderful. Well, we will um, <coughs> jump right into the meeting. You see our agenda meeting for the day. Um, we'll hear from our core team. Uh, we'll talk about facilities utilization. I think that's a topic that some of you may have learned a little bit about during your orientation. And then we will talk about the 2023 <coughs> CIP, our Capital Improvement Program. And uh, there's going to be a lot of information to cover, but hopefully one of the things you'll learn is why it's the Capital Improvement Program and not just like the Bond Improvement Program. 
some important distinctions. So um, for those of you who have reviewed the meeting minutes, is there any motion at this time? I'll move that we adopt them as presented. Ms. Edmonds has moved adoption of the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, Mr. Hershey has seconded. All in favor of approval of the minutes say aye. 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 Like sign nay. All right, the minutes have been approved. So we'll head into our first presentation. We will hear from Mark Strickland, who's our Chief of Facilities and Operations, who will tell us uh, what, what the core team is and what it does and why it's important to the district. Mark. Thank you, Chair Haggerty. Uh, the presentation today uh, has Emily Lucas's name on there. She's unable to be with her us today. I would like to note that uh, she participated in putting this together a lot, so she had a lot of input in it. I will note that we are going to talk about the core team today. There are other things that we'll talk about at later meetings as far as CIP, but this is about the core team, um, both for the new members and the existing. We kind of want to give a refresher about what the core team is and what it does. So we're going to talk about that uh, today. So the members of the core team are a strategic group of staff members from both Wake County and the school system that share the responsibility for the research, data gathering, forecasting, and production of the rolling seven-year CIP program. The CIP is the guiding document when approved by both the Board of Commissioners and the Board of Education that directs the building, renovating, and maintenance of school facilities in Wake County. It also provides funding for a variety of other critical aspects of the CIP plan such as the purchase of furniture and equipment, ADA projects, technology, technology infrastructure, security, land, and program management. The process is a collaborative effort with input from many staff members who provide specific area expertise as we develop the plan. You can see on the screen, this is the makeup of the core team. The county has budget, finance, and facility staff, as do we. We also add a component from our maintenance and operations department and school choice planning and assignment to round it out. In order to set the context of our presentation, we're going to discuss the purpose, goals, and scope of our work. The purpose of the work is to establish regular and informed dialogue between the county and the school system in the development and implementation of our seven-year rolling CIP. The group was created in 2014 and it has grown into a dedicated group of people that are fully focused on being effective and efficient with our work. There is a common set of goals that are important to our work. We identify specific areas of collaboration that lead to the development of our CIP plan, and that also meets the needs of the school system, and most importantly, respects the financial constraints of the county. Our annual work plan provides accountability and transparency as we develop the CIP. There are five major areas or work functions related to the CIP. There are enrollment projections, CIP program assumptions, budget appropriations and reallocations, site and land selection and acquisition, and school design and construction. Enrollment projections provide the forecasts and growth rates to guide us in student planning and assignment. Areas are identified for future school locations and assignment patterns are used to maximize the efficient use of school facilities. Key tasks of this work function include, include tracking enrollment data, enrollment forecast, and evaluating this data for changes to the CIP. Program assumptions provide us with a way to gain consensus on guidelines for the planning of new schools. They help us ensure compliance with the rules and regulations for designing and building schools. All of this helps us with our yearly CIP updates and revisions. Changes and modifications to educational programming, capacity and space standards, and costs and market conditions are all incorporated into the CIP work. A 
critical component of the CIP development is the budgeting and appropriation of the needed funds to complete the program. Matching the capital needs with the funding capacity of the county is a key part of this work. The ability to fund with appropriate types of debt in a timely manner is important to our success. Our work is increasingly focused on using data to identify future school sites. We are looking to be efficient with our funding resources to identify properties suitable for school construction. Key tasks include site searches, feasibility studies, and concept plans. Also, the negotiation and purchase or negotiation of purchase contracts and due diligence work and preparation of materials for approvals by both the school system and the county is also a part of the work. Lastly, the school design and construction work function looks to ensure that we adhere to our goals in designing and building schools. The work tasks of updating and maintaining our master CIP schedule, along with needed modifications, is key to the collaborative work that makes us successful. And with the purpose, goals, and scope covered, what do we see from our work? So we thought we'd share a few of the accomplishments. We've added a new funding category under program requirements for partial renovations and improvements. That's affectionately known as a PRIMP project, and you all will hear more about those later on in the coming weeks and months. The county isolated permits and other fees to help us fully maximize our school funding. We now have a separate line item for permits and fees. Enrollment forecasts have been <coughs> improved and now account for school choice and pandemic impacts that we had in the last few years. The CIP funding has been restructured. Now the county is using limited obligation bonds as a method and tool to finance the CIP program. A hot topic that's been discussed for the last six or eight months at least have been energy environmental conservation projects. We've had a lot of discussions about solar and uh, conservation and water source heat pumps and geothermal. And you may hear some more about that in the coming months. And then lastly, the, the core team has been able to collaborate with municipalities uh, on school sites and site enhancements. So the current 2022-23 CIP is broken down into several categories. Projects listed here are for new or replacement schools as determined by our long range planning process, which includes capacity projections, growth, facility utilization, and condition. Schools are identified by the name, location, and year of completion. Funding needs are noted on a yearly basis and a part of the overall funding picture provided by the county. Please note that fiscal years 24 and 25, highlighted in blue, are the years that are covered by the bond that was passed by Wake County voters last fall. The core team is currently beginning the process of updating the CIP plan, which will include fiscal year 30. Currently, it extends out to fiscal 29, but as we roll the seven years, we'll add year 30. New projects will be added based on data from our student assignment and long-range planning staff to meet the growth needs of the district. The second part of the, the CIP is existing school summary, and it includes a wide variety of projects throughout the county. These projects were vetted through an existing condition survey of schools and staff input from a variety of departments. Again, the school listing is shown, the area where it is located, and the year of completion, along with funding requirements. Some of these projects are full replacement projects, while others are major additions and renovations. As we focus on the update for this year in fiscal year 30, we will again look to add additional projects. And then lastly on the CIP is the program requirement summary. 
The CIP funds a variety of other programs, such as life cycle, ADA, and security projects. It also covers temporary classrooms, land purchases, and program management costs. We work with staff to identify needs in these major categories and align those needs with available funding from the county. And finally, this is a summary slide of all of the major CIP categories, new schools, existing schools, and program requirements. This forms the basis for the funding we receive in the seven-year CIP and is structured to fit within the debt model provided by the county staff. Staff from both the school system and the county are already meeting to discuss options, to look at projects, to discuss budgets and funding, and the result of that work will be presented to you all in the coming months. And then lastly, uh, we wanted to share with you that this has been a successful partnership. The core team combines the goals of both elected boards into workable objectives. We have great communication and collaboration, great team problem solving, and as needed, we bring in subject matter experts to help us develop these plans and recommendations. And with that, Chair McTaggarty, I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Strickland, I appreciate it. Um, so committee, you've seen the presentation that goes through and talks about our capital improvement <clears throat> program and tries to break it down. For the sake of discussion, I have a couple questions I'll just throw out to you, Mr. Strickland, um, and then if board members have additional questions, feel free to ask them at this time, and if not, we'll, we, can, we can roll forward. Uh, Superintendent Moore? If I could just add a piece, I guess a historical context to the core team. Um, there was a desire as we came out of that, those booming years of growth in the early 2000s, to understand how important it was. That we had to project out further than what bond periods covered in order to handle growth, overcrowding, renovation of existing schools. And so the, the notion of a rolling seven-year CIP was one that on the front end is more committed than on the tail end of those seven years um, so that we can respond to changing needs that may occur our circumstances that may occur, um, all of it um, then becomes, you know, as you get later on in the years, you may need to, to move or change some things based on what's happening, um, whether it's funding, whether it's school conditions, whether it is hoping that we had land for a school that we haven't been able to find, but we can find it in this other one that's also the next on the list, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I think it's also important that everything that's in the seven-year plan um, is not all, it, all of it is not funded through the bonds, some of it is cash, and so there are places where there's flexibility also to rearrange how you're using some dollars based on unanticipated needs that may come up. And the additions of things like PRIMP or previously SNAP as funded line items in the CIP, I think are an acknowledgement and recognition that sometimes we don't, um, number one, we may not know that we need something and we know, we realize we have a need and we have an opportunity. And in fact, I think I remember from uh, with, I can't remember whether it was, I think it was Betty Parker who was sitting behind me somewhere, um, that the whole notion of SNAP, the space needs analysis projection was like where opportunity and need clashed, right? Which we don't always anticipate. But PRIMP was one that was a recognition of there are larger projects that are needed that are not full on renovations of a school or teardowns of a school, but require more than just small dollars. So being able to incorporate those into our seven year plan as separate line items provides us a lot more flexibility about what our needs look like. And and I, I will tell you, you know, Emily is not well. I was in a meeting with her this morning, she was virtual. Um, and she did mention uh, potentially as we get closer in the spring um, and, and also depending on the timing of, usually in the spring there is a joint meeting of the boards, the Board of Education and the Board of Commissioners. And she expressed this morning having an interest perhaps in covering some of where we stand right now based on the, the most recent information that we have available as a part perhaps of that um, joint meeting when it comes up later in the spring. Um, and I mean there's a number of meetings coming up but she, uh, the, the core team itself um, is 
is something that as I go to other districts and speak to them that are growing and building schools and renovating and have that environment um, is very much, uh, very much, it was very much innovative at the time and it is one that other districts are looking to emulate as well because it really allows you to plan both the short term and long term for what you're doing with the opportunity to adjust as needed. Fantastic. Just a couple of moments. There. And that takes some of my questions off of my shelf. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, that's great because you, you hit on some of the, you know, some of the issues that it, are important to identify early on about where our funds come from for what kinds of projects. So, Mr. Strickland, I know when you have a seven-year plan, you make cost assumptions, and they don't always hold true. So, how do we? deal with inflation, escalation, where, you know, we've been looking seven years out, but suddenly there's supply chain issues or the cost of materials go up. How do we go in and then adjust the plan? When do we make the adjustments? Um, how does that process of revision work with the core team? So the, the adjustments are continual, you know, as we look at the plan each and every year. And obviously the, the near term or near year projections would be much more accurate than the ones out in the, the further years. We look at market conditions uh, and establish uh, what we think is adequate escalation. We look at bid prices and try to factor those in too. Um, it is likely that as we move forward with the presentation or compilation of the CIP for this year, you will see some of those adjustments based off of market conditions. And how do we how do we keep the seven year plan on schedule? So the. Um, the process is pretty involved, but we have a, a master schedule of projects. Mm -hmm. And so we, we plan them out years in advance. Um, I was looking at the schedule uh, this week. Uh, a project from start to finish could take anywhere from four to six years, mm -hmm. from the time that we might would engage an architect, um, go through that process, include approvals for plans with municipalities and then the construction period. One of the things that is being done in this newer schedule with the projects that are coming up is uh, we've increased the amount of time that we have for approvals with municipalities. It's, uh, there's a lot of work out there and it, it takes a long time to get things approved. Mm -hmm. And I've seen where we've had some delays before that can impact the costs. Right. It, it can um, and does. Um, we, we certainly are, are trying to mitigate those costs. I'll, I'll give you an example. We're looking internally. There's the core team and then there's another broader group uh, called the CIP team. And we're looking at ways internally and both with our external partners to identify places where we can reduce our costs. We're not looking at reducing quality of the stuff that we build, but we're looking at things that maybe we can do a little bit differently because we don't expect the cost to go down anytime soon. Okay. So we talked about the uh, new school plan. We've talked about existing plans. We talked a little bit about SNAP and PRIMP. I guess just for, for, for context for folks, if you have a project that, let's say, it's not a whole school renovation, but you have a critical system failure, HVAC goes out, or there's a structural issue with a parking lot or something like that. Those aren't bond funds, right? That's the, the other capital that we get. How does that work? So uh, what I think you may be referring to are life cycle projects. Yeah. Okay, so life cycle projects are just what they are. Uh, they are projects that have reached the end of their useful life. Uh, quite often that, is a, an HVAC system in a school, boilers, uh, gymnasium floors, bleachers, parking lots, anything that was installed and has reached the end of its useful life, we have a separate category in the, the CIP to look at life cycle projects. Okay, great. All right, um, so that's everything that I saw. I know and as we were talking about the meeting, Sam, you had some other questions. Well, maybe, or? Um, I was speaking with Mark before, and it, we're going to address them, I think, uh, in a future meeting. Yes. Okay. No. Yeah, that, that fits more in with the question, so we're not way off Jumping topic. Around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I'll turn it over to the rest of the committee or the other board members. Does anyone have any questions about the core team or anything about the CIP? We're going to talk more about the CIP later in the meeting, but just with what you've heard so far. 
Yeah, I've been several. Um, how often does the team meet? You may have said, but I missed it. So the core team, the core team is, yeah. is meeting right now once a month. Okay. But the CIP team is meeting more regularly. Mm -hmm. As we get into the heat of putting this together, mm -hmm. we typically meet every two weeks. Okay. And then um, please tell us the difference between limited obligation bonds and... Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I can tell you what I know. If Emily were here, I believe she would tell you that... Um, I've heard her explain it before, okay. and I, it can't, so I can't make it stick. They're GO bonds <laughs> and LOBs, which are limited mm -hmm, obligations. Mm -hmm. GO, or general obligation bonds, require the vote mm -hmm, of the public, mm -hmm. and limited obligation bonds do not. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially... And beyond that... Superintendent Moore, do you want to? Um, or Chris? There, there might be occasionally some differences with regards to the interest rates that, yeah. that they that they get, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but so so I think um, the the county looking at both general obligation and limited obligation bonds is a function more right now of the legislation that only allows the voters to vote on bonds in even numbered years, which means you either have to do them every two years or every four years. Um, I believe that there there has been some conversation about of a bond package that covered four years, but that number is much larger, and so the county has instead the decided to go with the two years on the bond and then use alternative financing of the limited obligation bonds in the other two years so that we are not going back to the community as frequently in a vote. Thank you. That's helpful. And then my last question is please um, tell us again the abbreviation SNAP and PRIMP. Uh, SNAP, <laughs> SNAP is I think I got. Station is not. PRIMP is yeah. partial renovation and improvement. Partial renovation. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Go ahead. Any other questions, Mr. Strickland? Oh, I, I do want to say I just want to thank the Wake County voters for giving us bond money. We got to thank them because we wouldn't be able to get a lot of things done without them. Very true. Very true, Ms. Coffey. I'm not sure if this is necessarily in regards to that, or if maybe I need to wait on that question. But I'm just trying to understand the process of like as you go around, you visit the schools, and you have different needs for each one. How does the process work of getting the attention they need? Like, how, how does it get evaluated? Like, so, prioritized. So, two things. Um, if it is a a work order, there's a process to submit a work order. If it's what we call a, a fact mod or a facility uh, modification, they can. There's a whole web portal. Schools are well trained on it, where they can submit uh, a fact mod, and then that can morph into uh, a print project or a SNAP project or some other type of project. So let's say, for example, um, they wanted uh, a room painted or a hallway painted or something done that's minor in nature. So they would go in and submit something. Also, we changed the process. Lots of schools have the ability to self-fund things. So if we change the process so that only the schools can submit those uh, modifications past um, other groups could do it, but we wanted to kind of rein that in so that the schools know what's going on. So if a school has uh, the ability to uh, install a shade structure at a school over a playground and they have the PTA funds to do it, they can submit it and then we will help them work through the process and implement it. I do think it's important to note that when it comes to things like work orders for maintenance, um, they, they are, I think they're assigned a priority level or something along those lines. And, and I will just say that um, we, it is the reality of the labor market, the vacancies that we have, that a school that might need a hallway painted is going to be a lower priority than a school that is having an issue with a sewage that's coming up in the floor in the middle that's an emergency need that has to be addressed right away. So um, that can be really frustrating at a school level when you know that you have needs and you've documented it and you've put them in. But there are other things that sometimes will interrupt the ability to get towards some of the more routine things. And that really is a function of capacity staffing, um, which is something that we're continually working on. So. Because I want, just want to acknowledge that um, we hear from our principals regularly when they have needs. Sure. Can you, I, and I, this might be part of the question that hasn't gotten answered yet. How does the school get on the priority list? 
for, for renovation. So if there's, okay. right, what does that look like sure. and how does a school get on this list right. before us? So um, in the fall of 21, we completed a facility needs assessment of our 55 uh, oldest schools. Um, it was an extensive list. We hired a third party assessment team to come in and look at, look at our schools. That uh, in combination, we have a rubric that you all will be hearing about in the coming weeks and months. We have a rubric that we go through that looks at facility conditions, looks at environmental issues, uh, it looks at assignment and also educational adequacy. So different groups of people uh, work on those assessments and we come together and rank the schools. And that's how we ended up with the schools in the current list of projects that we have that we're working on, existing schools and renovations. So it's a pretty extensive process. And doesn't the board contribute to that ranking? Okay. Don't I feel, well, I feel like I've seen that presented. So this is something that we talked about in our planning meeting, that understanding that prioritization process, how things are scored, is important. Because obviously you're going to hear from people about needs in their schools. Sure. And you might have something that you think this is a top priority, but if you haven't been to another school in another part of the county, you might not realize that they have an even worse situation. So we do, we do have, we actually are planning a future committee meeting where staff will go through and sort of explain the process, explain those rankings, and let you see. And that will be something that every few years we might come back and do like a new assessment. But the assessments are good for a while, right? If we did it every year, it would be too much, and we wouldn't. I don't know that we have the staff that we could do it every year. Um, so it's it's making sure you as board members kind of like know what the factors are. If there's needs that haven't been identified, you know, bringing them up to staff's attention and going from there. It's not necessarily like we vote or say, well, we want to move this one up or down. It's more about kind of understanding that process. And, and we bring recommendations. Obviously, you all get to vote on them and, and can ask questions. Um, I think we, with the current iteration of the CIP plan, I think we are addressing 12 of the, of the top 13 schools in the list. How often do they have these assessments? Um, the current assessment we think will be good for about three years. Um, you know, as we work off the top of the list, our priorities may change about how we do things. For example, we, we may not be looking at as many complete teardowns and, and rebuilds. It could be that we do uh, a greater number of smaller projects to affect our schools. So those are some of the discussions that we're having right now. So if I could give an example, maybe that will help elaborate, and that's where I was kind of going with that, so thank you. But um, so there was an elementary school that I visited, and the roof, um, although it looked like you could dismember it and use their barn you know, for some projects, and it would be great for that, it looked like it was falling down, and they actually had it closed off. They weren't using it. Um, and they said that that was the repair after the repair. And, they had lots of work orders and there was flooding. She showed me a video where there was hot water pouring out of the ceiling and not like dripping into While the bucket and pouring. No, it had just happened over winter break. Oh. It, it, it was closed off because they couldn't use it right, right. now. They did get it to stop. Um, but the building was 93 years old and the building behind it was 100 years old. And so it was like a lot of different things, but I don't think that it was actually on the list. So I was just curious with that one in mind, and going over this process, like, how does it kind of move up since that happened over winter break? It might not have been when you assess the building. It might have seemed like, okay, we've had a lot of work orders. We've fixed it to the point where it's like, okay, we keep fixing our repairs now, and this building sold. It might not really be that great. So that is a component of the process. We look at the work orders that are generated, too. I mean, it's a, a part of... And, and without you know, talking through the specific school, maybe there's something that, that we can look at and address. Uh, I can tell you that in the, the CIP funding, um, we spend every dime that we get. The needs are great and the, the resources are not. Um, our focus has been on keeping kids dry and, and cool and warm where they're supposed to be and keeping the border running. So we're focusing on big picture things, but I'll certainly be glad to have a conversation about that particular school if you'd like. Yeah. 
I was just wondering, like, because if you're saying three years, like, how does it, like, just the process itself? So, again, not knowing the specifics and, and being able to look at the reports, um, I don't know how it would compare to other schools. Right. Because if you go around the district and look, we have some schools that really need a lot of work. And I do think, and we've seen from the interest here, this is a topic that we need to come back to and make sure everyone fully gets it and can understand the process and know how to provide that input. Right. Any other questions? All right, then. Thank you, Mr. Strickland. Thanks. All right. So next on our agenda, we're going to talk about uh, facility utilization. Um, this is an important topic we'll hear a lot about as we talk about, for example, student assignment, or we look at school transfers. Um, I'll be hearing today from Celeroy, who'll be giving us the 2022-2023 report. You may have talked a little bit about some of this in orientation, but I think we'll take a deeper dive and see what the latest numbers look like. superintendent and staff. Can you all hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for allowing us some time to present the 2022-23 facility utilization report. The presentation today will be a little bit more detailed. Oh, got it. The presentation today will be a little bit more detailed than a standard release of the fur in order to give some helpful background data for new board members. Utilization report or FER data is used to support many efforts and is published two times per year. Once in the fall with the official PMR2 membership and once in the spring with the projected membership for the following school year. The background data in the FER helps us monitor compliance with class size legislation highlights when a school may need to be capped, and when there are issues with how a building is being utilized. The FER data helps provide consistency in expectations, equity in how a building can and should be utilized, and is necessary to support long-range assignment needs and to plan for the growing needs of the district. Board members use the FER data for approving enrollment caps as part of the transfer appeal hearings process and for the development, review, and implementation of assignment plans. Today, we will give you a FER overview, highlight changes to the 2022-23 FER, and answer questions. There are a few terms that are important to understand and how they relate to the firm. I would like to highlight a few of those. Those are ADM, PMR2, and enrollment. Historically, we have used the terms membership and enrollment interchangeably, but it is important to understand the difference. ADM, or average daily membership, is subject to attendance violations, whereas enrollment is the total number of students who are enrolled at a school regardless of attendance violations. An enrolled student is not counted in the ADM after 10 consecutive unexcused absences, which is otherwise referred to as an attendance violation or a violation of the 10-day rule. So you'll probably hear 10-day rule off and on. When enrolled students return to school, they are once again counted in the ADM. PMR2, or the principal's monthly report, is month two of the average daily membership. This number is used for district budgeting for the school year and the December FER publication. 
during any standard year, the enrollment numbers are typically higher than the ADM and PMR2. It is important to note the funding for the students enrolled above PMR2 is not identified in our base funding request and must be identified from other sources. And I know the superintendent's going to come back to that. Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I just want to, I want to put that in bold letters, right? School systems in North Carolina are not funded based on the number of students we serve but on the number of students that don't have attendance violations, it's a lower number. So while we are funded based on ADM, we still must have resources for students based on enrollment. So there is a difference. What's needed to serve enrolled students is higher than how we are funded. So just a small point. Thank it's you. all of North Carolina. Awesome. Next slide. One area that affects the FER is the school's capacity. School capacity is the underlining metric for determining crowding, new school locations, membership forecasting, and CIP planning. Each new school construction or renovation project that is brought to the Board of Education at schematic design for approval is designed for a specific capacity and follows a specific capacity model. The capacity model defines the number and types of classrooms and the number of students or capacity for each and the planned use for each of the classrooms in the brick and mortar building at each school. The example capacity model on this slide shows the capacity classrooms above the red line and non-capacity classroom spaces below the red line. Crowded schools that need more capacity spaces utilize non-capacity spaces from below the line to accommodate capacity classrooms above the line. For example, if a school needs an additional first grade classroom, they could use a not, an unused non-capacity classroom from below the line to accommodate the additional class needed above the line. And in this scenario, as a first grade, it also has to be on the first floor. In this scenario, the school's capacity does not change, but the utilization would then be above the assigned capacity and would reflect a higher crowding number. Capacity, non-capacity, and retired trailers are viewed in the same manner as the brick and mortar building based off of their uses and they affect the campus capacity at schools as reflected on the firm. Similar to the capacity model shown here, capacity models for elementary and middle schools also reflect the traditional and multi-track year-round capacities. The CIP program assumptions confirm that new elementary and middle schools are constructed utilizing a schedule that permits the board to assign them a traditional or multi-track year-round calendar. For new schools, the Board of Education will typically make a decision on whether to open an elementary or middle school as traditional or multi-track closer to the time that the school is opening. class size legislation dictates the number of students per class in grades K through 3, which affects the capacity at our elementary schools. There are no legislative limitations on the number of students in fourth or fifth grade classes or at middle school and high school classes. Monitoring the size of classes at each grade level is important to ensure compliance with the legislation and avoid overcrowding at individual schools. The information on this slide reinforces the importance of controlling class size in kindergarten and first grade. In this example, the kindergarten class of 2018-19 will then be the first grade class in 2019-20.
So if we had allowed the kindergarten class to grow too large, the next year we would need an additional classroom, an additional teacher at first grade in order to accommodate the increased number of students aging forward as the first grade class size is reduced from kindergarten. We can request waivers to accommodate a plus three student amount in individual classes, but we must maintain an average of 18 with no more than 21 students for kindergarten, an average of 16 with no more than 19 students for first grade, and an average of 17 with no more than 20 students for second and third grade. Even with the flexibility of the plus three waivers, we must meet class size averages for grades K through three at the individual grade level across the district. This legislation impacts the school facilities, transportation, student assignment, teacher allotments, the budget, et cetera. When the legislation was enacted, WCPSS immediately had 559 fewer classrooms or approximately 9,500 fewer seats available at our elementary schools without additional funding. And Superintendent Moore, let me know if you want to jump in on that one. I, I would just say that we did a lot of work when that first happened. It was literally nine to ten elementary schools that we became short when the legislation was implemented and 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 it is why the legislation took so long to actually take effect and waivers had to be in place for multiple years because districts especially districts that were growing or districts that didn't have capacity to build new schools or didn't have them in the right places you, you were just immediately short classrooms and in our district as large as we are with the growth that we were still experiencing especially in the west part of the county, we were immediately short nine to ten elementary schools, and we've been pinging at it ever since. Thank you. New schools are typically not opened at full capacity. They open at an adjusted percentage per your slide until they are at full capacity in either years two or three. Our high schools, for example, typically open with ninth and 10th graders, and then they age forward until the school is at full capacity in the third year. The FER is formatted to reflect crowding based on the design capacity in the brick and mortar building and capacity trailers. This format helps provide consistent reporting of data and reflects the maximum flexibility to accommodate area growth. Schools are grouped by category, elementary, middle, high, etc. Following the school code and name, you will see the student membership number, or in this case PMR2, the building design capacity as explained in slide four, the number of capacity trailers, the school crowding percentage with capacity trailers, and lastly, the non-capacity and retired trailers. As a trailer side note, our CIP program assumptions call for the planning of four trailers at elementary, six trailers at middle and high school when the, it, that's possible. It may not always be possible. In our years where we were growing at a really fast pace, we were not always able to follow that. So when you look at the fur, you'll notice there are some schools that have substantially more than four, six, and six trailers. As mentioned earlier, we monitor and track the utilization data because one, it is critical to ensure compliance with the legislation. Two, to accommodate the seven year special programs and pre-K master plan. Three, to support capping recommendations and transfer request. And four, to support long range CIP planning. Now we will highlight some of the changes to the 2022-23 firm. For elementary schools, the caps were removed from two schools, Combs Elementary and Lead Mine Elementary. New caps were placed on four schools, Apex Elementary, Holly Ridge Elementary, Parkside Elementary, and River Bend Elementary. 
three schools move from multi-track year round to single track year round, Banks Road Elementary, Middle Creek Elementary, and Westlake Elementary. Two new schools opened at 80% capacity, Apex Friendship Elementary and Barton Pond Elementary. And two schools received major renovations or in their cases, complete replacements and have increased capacities, which are Fuller Elementary and York Elementary. For middle schools, one new middle school opened at 60% capacity, <coughs> Herbert Aikens Road Middle School. One school changed from multi-track year round to single track year round, Westlake Middle School. West Millbrook Middle School, which is undergoing a phased major renovation replacement project, moved into their new school on the same site with an increased capacity. For high schools, one new Early College High School opened on the Wake Tech campus at RTP, the Wake Early College of Information and Biotechnologies. The additional component of that school will open alongside Parkside Middle on a shared campus in the future, and it's right now projected to be around 2025. Wake STEM Early College High School moved to its new location right down the street at the end of the 2021 school year and their increased capacity is reflected in the 2022-23 firm. Willow Spring High School is in its second year and therefore its capacity increased to 75%. Now we would like to share a visualization of the firm. The graph on this page represents current crowding levels at our elementary schools. <coughs> schools that have four trailers as specified in our CIP program assumptions are noted with small icons. And schools with more than four trailers are noted with large icons, along with their calendar assignments. School locations without trailers are noted with the circle only. The white spaces show area crowding of less than 90%. The yellow spaces show area crowding of 90% to 100%. The peach spaces show area crowding of 100% to 110%. And the red spaces show area crowding over 110%. I just want to say thank you for putting this map in the backup materials so I can see it without having to like be yes, inside of my screen. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Here we Okay. Great. This graph represents the current crowding levels at our middle schools. Schools that have six trailers as specified in our CFP program assumptions are noted with small icons. Schools with more than six trailers are noted with large icons, along with their calendar assignments. School locations without trailers are noted with a circle only. Similar to the elementary schools, the white spaces show area crowding of less than 90%. The yellow spaces show area crowding of 90% to 100%. The peach spaces show area crowding of 100% to 110%, and the red spaces show area crowding over 110%. The graph on this page represents current crowding at our high schools. Schools that have six trailers as specified in our CIP program assumptions are noted with small icons. And schools with more than six trailers are noted with large icons with their calendar assignments. School locations without trailers are noted with a circle only. Similar to elementary and middle schools, the white spaces is area crowding that's less than 90%. Yellow is area crowding of 90 to 100%. The peach spaces are area crowding of 100% to 110%. The red spaces are area crowding over 110%. Following this presentation of the 2022-23 firm, we will be bringing capping recommendations.
and the membership forecast to the February 15th Facilities Committee meeting. We will be bringing the 2023-24 FER projections to the March 15th Facilities Committee meeting. On this slide, we have also provided titles and dates for previous presentations that may provide some helpful background information. We did, we did, ask, I did ask about putting those previous presentations on here because this can be a lot to digest for something that you're going to need to look at voting on next month. So this might give you some more background to the things that you've heard today. Thank you. The 2022-23 FER with the official PMR2 membership and the 2022-23 FER sorted by board member along with the elementary, middle, and high crowding maps are attached as backup to this presentation. As a recap, the FER is published twice a year, once in March based on projected student allotments and typically once in December, we're a little bit late this year, um, in December based on actual student membership reported to DPI. The FER data is used to support many efforts. It helps us monitor compliance with class size legislation, is used in determining when a school may need to be capped, and when there are issues with how a building is being utilized. Consistency in expectations and equity in how a building can and should be used is necessary to support long-range assignment needs and to plan for the growing needs of the district. Thank you for this time today, and I'm happy to try to answer any of your questions. All right, thank you, Ms. Roy. Um, all of these issues are interrelated to other issues we work with. Uh, we do want to keep our questions and our presentation focused on what you presented today, but we will have conversations about how trailers are utilized at our schools. You know, you might say, well, we've got a capped school, but there's no trailers. Why is that? And maybe it's municipal regulation, maybe it's something about the actual site. Um, but those are you know, good questions to ask in terms of assignment, in terms of our capping decisions, all of these things will come into play. But based on what you saw, based on how they calculate um, facilities utilization, are there any questions? I got a couple. Um, and this, the first one goes to the, the enrollment number and what the state pays us. What's the percentage difference there generally for Wake County? No, I, that, That's I'm okay. Not, yeah, no, I'll have to figure that out because we already, we have some local anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think the way it shows up is um, uh, in our budget we have a, what's the title of the, the dollars you do? Targeted enrollment. Okay. So we have a targeted enrollment pot of local dollars yeah. that we have available when a school's That's where I am. numbers line up in such a way that they don't earn a resource that they might need for an additional class so that schools can request that. So you have some sense of it by understanding what the size of the pot is of our targeted enrollment. But it's a couple million dollars a year at least. Okay. At least. When did they start doing that? Is that recent or is that something that well, the state it was, has it was been an, doing? It was an impact of the class size legislation that started us doing that. Okay. And, and then it also, um, there's also a function associated with multi-track year-round schools that almost have to have a crowding of around 110% or more in order to actually efficiently utilize all four tracks. Wow, okay. So so there, there's, there's a couple places where we have to look at it. Got it. Um, so wait, are we not asking trailer questions? Because I had two trailer <laughs> questions, actually. So long as it's not like a specific. No, I just want to know what we do with retired trailers. I assume that means we shut them down. And It, it depends. Uh, a retired trailer on one campus, when we went into COVID, may very well have been brought back into service because we needed additional space on campus. Like we needed to provide a COVID care area. We needed, to provide, and that's not saying we put COVID care in a retired trailer. Right. That's just simply saying we needed additional spaces on that campus. And so we utilized those uh, trailers. Those don't work. Um, sorry. Oh, oh, you're fine. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. 
Oh, you're good. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, the other trailers that may fall into that category, we have certain campuses that have transportation centers. Like I think East Cary Middle School as an example, has a trailer sitting there, and it's not used for school purposes, but it's used for the transportation staff to check in and so forth for, for busing. Um, the, other, the other question I have is when we are under capacity at a school that, that has trailers, do we utilize the trailers at that point, or is everyone inside the school? We would typically try to use the spaces inside the building. Um, but we, one of the things that you probably saw at the, on the last presentation was a line item that talked about temp classrooms. We only receive X amount of money for each year to deal with trailers, and that's new placements, that's removals, yeah. and the cost of that was going up exponentially prior to, I mean, pr previous, excuse me, prior to COVID. Right. So now it's an even bigger challenge in, in dealing with that. So if a, a school is under enrolled, we may very well have units that are still sitting on that campus that the term we used to use was mothball, but like I said, with once COVID hit, things that were once considered mothballed yeah. were no longer necessarily mothballed. We just simply did not have the money to, to remove them or relocate them. Uh, okay. The last question I have is, um, who determines capacity at a school? And I'm just going to say this because a school brought up wanting more magnet seats and they have trailer. I'm just because they said maybe they have classrooms that, or space that isn't being used, but I'm looking at their capacity number and maybe it's, maybe they're at capacity already kind of thing, so. Uh, can you switch to slide four, four real quick? Slide four is an example of a capacity model that would demonstrate the uses of all the spaces at this example elementary school. Right. You have a similar model for all elementary, middle, and high. It's not necessarily tracked in here as a magnet because we wouldn't be opening a brand new school as a right. magnet school. Right. It's typically an existing school that is converted to that. And I'm gonna let um, Mr. Glenn Carosas, because so magnet also falls under our school choice planning and assignment group, but as far as how to, to divvy up magnet classes. Got it. Oh, excuse me. Could you all stop there? Appreciate it. <laughs> so magnet classes um, are all additional offerings at the school that may take up additional classrooms in the building. When we've done renovations, they've built in classrooms for magnet electives, particularly um, going back to a recent one, Wiley Elementary, where they've built in magnet elective classrooms. So sometimes you may have schools looking to utilize those classrooms as additional space um, for additional instructional programs. Um, you're also looking at, let's say, Hunter Elementary, which is an AG, um, GT elementary. I know this from when my children were at the school. Oftentimes when the children go to electives, they may push electives into the existing classrooms. So that's why you may have additional classroom space in the building that schools may ask for additional students because they feel like that those rooms aren't all being utilized. But falling back to what Ms. Rory says, the best practice for the district is to adhere to the capacity model that this, the school has been set with her calculations. Got it. I, I think another way to sort of phrase that is, to exceed your capacity model and use your non-capacity classrooms differently than designated really requires and usually is followed up with a conversation with the area superintendent because if a classroom is designated as a CCR classroom for students who might be identified with special needs for extra support, mm -hmm. to turn that into a first grade classroom now removes the ability to use it for the purpose for which it was intended. So when I, whenever you want to use a non-capacity classroom for regular capacity, yeah. that conversation needs to happen with the area superintendent about short-term need, long-term need, you know, because you know we could have, especially in some of our schools, they could create additional classrooms by deciding to put all art on a car on music on a cart, right. those kinds of things, which are not necessarily best practices, so. Area soup? Yes. <laughs> wow. 
we're going to talk a little chat later. <laughs> if, if I could share as well, thank you both. Um, we Long range planning does track that information annually. Uh, typically after the uh, current year's fur rolls out, we begin to send information out to every school with their floor plans, their spreadsheets, basically asking how are you using these areas. So while we have a capacity model saying this is how we should be using it, sometimes you may have a bubble in an area that all of a sudden everybody in there decided to have babies and five years later I have way more right. kindergarten classes. Right. And so as the superintendent just mentioned, that's we don't want to permanently put some of those sure. below the line spaces on carts or make compromises to accommodate that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions, Ms. Evans? Yeah, two. Um, uh, the first is, can you talk a little bit about um, the benefit, the reason, the why when we convert a multi-year track school to a single track versus converting it to traditional? I understand there's now, if that's a conversation that needs to happen another time, that's fine. We, we, can, we can look at it a couple different ways. The disruption to families of mm -hmm. going from a multi-track year, year round to a traditional mm -hmm. would be quite challenging. Right. We had a situation a number of years ago where we had a school that was traditional. We turned it to multi-track year round, and unfortunately for this particular school, we had a lot of flight. Mm -hmm. So it was a situation where all of a sudden we did not need multi-track year round there, so we switched it back to traditional, and everybody came back, and now I'm in a situation of needing to cap it. So by maintaining at least a single track in a multi-track year round calendar, it's easier to come back, and I say easy because I'm not, uh, my chief is the person who, who has a deal with that, but it's it's easier to, to add another track than it is to go and flip an entire um, school back to traditional. Now, I will say, and Mr. Strickland's sitting right there beside you, it also creates some challenges for transportation. Um, one of the things that you'll hear me talk about often as I sit in front of the board is the impact on transportation. So whenever I come back and start talking about capping recommendations at the next meeting, you'll hear me talk about the impact of that crowded school and what ends up happening downstream as far as our resources or lack thereof. Sure. Okay. I will also add that a multi-track year round costs more because some of your positions become 12-month mm -hmm. positions instead of 10-month positions. Um, and the building is in operation all 12 months, so whether it's utilities or other things, it costs more. In order for that to be cost effective, you must be full at all four tracks. Right. If you're not full at all four tracks and you're short here or there and, and you don't maybe don't need to be multi-track, there's a, there's a point of diminished return in there somewhere, to use an economic term, where um, you're better off going single track um, but leaving the flexibility to go back multi-track if you need to because the, the, the cost is, it is now more cost effective to be single track than it is to be multi-track and putting additional resources towards a lowered enrollment. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, and my other question is, um, I'm looking at this, I don't know which document it is, but where it lists all the schools, the facility utilization. Oh, the backup. The, yeah, the backup materials. I'm just curious, if, if, to, if not today, um, what flexibility the restart schools have with regard to facilities? Because I understand they do have quite a bit of flexibility in other areas, so I'm curious to know what their... So I, I will just say that we are working on a full-on orientation for the board on restart and all of that. about that. So, That's fine. So it can think, wait. So we can, yeah. we can keep that as, as part of that yeah. presentation as well. That'd be great. Because there are some differences, yes. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Okay, great. And, and these are some very good questions and things that are going to come up in other topics that we cover. Um, you got the projections in February when we talk about capping. We're going to come back to this uh, when you get the membership report and look at how these things, and it'll give us a chance to explore some other issues like where we may have had a school that was multi-track year round and maybe collapsed a track. What was the economic impact, right? Or, you know, 
what you know, are there schools that would be considered that are traditional that would be considered for going multi-track or ones that are multi-track that would look to convert. All of that will come once we see the enrollment numbers, but these are very good, very good questions. Uh, any other for the committee? All right, Ms. Rory, you did an excellent job. No awesome. more questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Lynn, I'm looking for when we had that discussion about moving to multi-track to year-round. I'm not finding it yet, but I know it was yeah. sometime yeah. between October of 2021 and I was thinking no. it was yeah. for their we really do have a lot of great resources. I know it might not be your favorite streaming service, but if you go back through Assembly, you can see some of the older oh, yeah. meetings that we've done where we've covered some of these topics. I really appreciate you putting those links in there because like where we had a really involved discussion about trailers and how they work, reinventing the wheel, we can just go back because the basic information is still the same and that'll bring up speed. And that's something you can give to not just constituents, but like if you talk to town officials or county officials sometimes about why we do something a certain way, being able to share that is, is really helpful. All right. So now we'll turn to the 2023 program assumptions, design guidelines, space standards with Mr. Douglas Congdon. And Douglas, I know you've got your presentation here, but as you introduce yourself, you might want to explain kind of what your role is with the committee and with the district as well. Of course. Good afternoon, everybody. Good yeah. to see you all be with you today. So um, as Mr. Haggerty mentioned, uh, we're going to be providing an update on the program's assumptions as well as the design guidelines. This is something we do annually. And um, what we'd like to do uh, this afternoon is talk about a few items. So we're going to uh, highlight who's part of the CIP team, uh, as Mr. Strickland mentioned. And then we're going to talk about the status of the process and the schedule. Um, we'll then uh, dig into the program assumptions themselves and then uh, give you an update as well on the design guidelines. But really quickly, who are you yes. and, and what's will, our relation with yes. Cummings? And Certainly. Yes. Let folks yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm Douglas Congdon, and I am. Uh, I report directly to Mark Strickland, um, Program Executive for Facilities Design and Construction. So uh, I assist Mark in uh, running that program. Um, we are a third-party consultant. We work for the Cumming Group. And... Um, we have uh, four full-time employees that I'll report up direct to Mark, um, and uh, we assist in all aspects of running, design, constru and construction of all aspects of the FDNC program. Thank you. Good? Yeah. Great. All right. So uh, on this slide, uh, what we'd like to just take a moment to to share is that indeed that committee. And as Mr. Strickland mentioned, um, in the months of January, generally through April, because of the amount of content that we're working through and then bringing to you all, we do generally meet twice a month. Uh, as we get through that process and we get to the months of May through the end of the year, each year calendar-wise, uh, we're typically meeting monthly. Uh, and as you look <clears throat> from left to right on the slide, You'll see several departments that uh, are shown, which, of course, FDNC, which we've said, maintenance and operations, school choice planning assignment, which you've heard from this afternoon. Uh, we also have finance and academics. And then lastly, and just as important, is our key partnership with the county, uh, who is uh, our funding partner. And you'll note that, uh, as well, the, uh, the other stakeholder groups that we interact with frequently, also on the bottom of this slide, which includes groups like technology, <clears throat> child nutrition, transportation, security, communications, athletics, media, CTE, and then, of course, the core team, which Mr. Strickland referenced to as well. On this slide, uh, we'd like to take a moment to provide a snapshot of what this schedule looks like. This is a, a schedule that's been in progress. As you can see, that this is something that uh, these items uh, that we'll be bringing to you, we've been working on them since the fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, and from top to bottom, they include uh, some of the very things that we've already talked about this afternoon, which are student enrollment, the very program assumptions, the guidelines, cost model, and then, of course, those updates and requests for approvals each year. 
Um, one item that is not on here that Mr. Strickland mentioned would be the prioritization review for our existing schools. Uh, as he noted, the, the deep analysis that was done uh, about a year ago uh, is such that uh, that'll be good for three years. Um, however, what we would like to do at some point in the next couple of meetings is, is bring a, a presentation to you, a uh, 101 of sorts, to provide you the history uh, of what's been done on that particular topic. Uh, there's also a uh, reference on this slide to the, the joint board meeting uh, that the superintendent mentioned as well. All right, so uh, with that, we will dive into the program assumptions. Um, and what I'd like to do is, is frame it by starting and saying that this is the guiding document that's utilized uh, as we design and construct our schools and has uh, several important parts and pieces like technology and security and land uh, and the, the guidelines that we follow uh, in doing that. So most of these recommendations that we have noted here this afternoon are language in nature, meaning that you know the recommendations to tweak language for, for that particular reason and uh, I'll start moving through this uh, I won't read it verbatim but um, it's here for discussion purposes so uh, modification number one is under our program um, I want to be clear that in adding this language which is a shared observation space it is not increasing the square footage of the building uh, it is part of our special program and um, this would be uh, within the square footage of the building. Item number two, which is under technology. Uh, as you all can appreciate, there was a time when the ratio of device to student was three to one. Uh, during the pandemic, we quickly had to pivot and go one to one. Uh, as a result, uh, there are a need, there is a need for more resources to, to address that. So you'll note in that language um, that it addresses that exact point. Uh, we move on to uh, number three. Uh, as Mr. Strickland mentioned earlier this afternoon, there has been uh, an important push in our county uh, to be more sustainable. And so we felt it appropriate to add uh, the language uh, sustainability into that title in particular. Um, item number four. Um, there was a time when uh, there was discussion of actually uh, evaluating one-seventh of our school facilities, uh, the actual number of buildings. Um, as as uh, compared to the square footage, we wanted to edit this to reflect what's actually being done, meaning that the number of one-seventh of the facilities are being evaluated, not the square footage um, on an annual basis. Uh, we move down to the, the next item, which is also under the renovation of his existing facilities category. Again, this is a language change, uh, and we're simply taking this and we are moving it to another section uh, altogether. Same thing for modification number six. Number seven, um, as was discussed earlier in the, the FUR uh, presentation, uh, we're trying to be consistent in the document and refer to uh, trailers um, as flexible capacity. So the language change here uh, was for that purpose. And then um, with respect to the site plans, uh, you know, the team felt that uh, the removal of the language utility infrastructure was appropriate given uh, typically historically what we uh, have experienced. And um, I do want to note too, I should have said this at the beginning, that when we, when we go through this annually, uh, the document is reviewed uh, twice with our CIP team. Uh, we did do that and then it's reviewed with our core team. Uh, last item, uh, modification number eight speaks to uh, non-traditional and operational support facilities and um, the group felt that it was important to add the provision of facilities for our SNAP needs, which is one of our important uh, funding buckets. Number nine uh, and 10 are both under the safety and security. Uh, 
section of our program assumptions um, in talking with Russ Smith, who is our Senior Director of Security. Uh, we collaborated with him, uh, and he has requested uh, this language modifications, modification, excuse me. Um, it is a change in language that uh, is putting the language really in the hands um, of our staff and students. We want to be very clear that safety is critical right now. We know that there's a lot going on out there that certainly is, is fluid, and we want to make it clear that uh, safety and security for all staff and students is our top priority. Lastly, uh, as we consider the design of our buildings and we consider the very importance of that topic, security, uh, in discussing with, with Russ again, uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, it's in line with best security practices for those various students and staff. In this section, the, the impact really is to strengthen and be more explicit about the importance of safety and language and the assumptions. Yeah. Program standards and design guidelines. Um, so let's transition into that portion of this. Uh, again, that's an annual exercise. Uh, that's something that is ongoing throughout the course of every calendar year. Uh, there is a vehicle by which those that have interest in making requests or recommendations have the ability to submit them. The team reviews them on an ongoing basis throughout the course of the year. And then when we reach the, uh, the fall, um, there's a deadline by which uh, submissions are required to be, to be in at the end of October each year. Uh, they are reviewed. Uh, the, the items that are submitted, then uh, Mr. Strickland and I sit down uh, with our QA department and we re review each of them. We certainly have comments, questions, we go back and forth, and then we ultimately finalize with a goal by the end of the, that particular calendar year. Um, again, this is one of those situations where the majority of the recommendations tend to be language in nature. Um, and important to note that after this year's review, uh, there are no recommended material changes that would have cost impact to our capital improvement plan, which I think is important to stress. If we did have a recommendation uh, for an item that was going to bring cost impact, we would be bringing that to you for, for discussion. Let's look at the timeline. Uh, we'll hit this one more time. Uh, we've, we've talked uh, this afternoon about those very guidelines and program assumptions. Cost model will be on deck to bring you a presentation for that at the February meeting. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we will plan to bring a 101 for the rubric prioritization in February or March. Uh, SNAP and prim prioritization and processes. And then as Mr. Strickland mentioned, um, as a part of our seven-year plan, there are several other critical components like security. Uh, technology obviously is an important one. And then as, as referenced in our presentation this afternoon about the FUR, the mobiles. And uh, as we finish up, we've touched on our CIP team committee process, the schedule that you all should expect, and the deliverables that will come to you during the course of that process. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Congdon. Um, I have a couple questions, but before we go to me, we'll just go around the room. Uh, Ms. Jim Haffey, Ms. Caulfield, switch in direction. Sure. Um, I'm curious, you know, one of the things that I recall is being a female-dominated industry, um, people go on parental leave. And in many workspaces, we're able to create spaces for lactation rooms or, or rooms where a person could pump um, during that time. In schools, generally, it's let's clean out this closet, let's clean out this. Uh, server room or whatever space we find available. Has it been considered adding that to the program assumptions to have a space where you could have a refrigerator and a small chair for folks that come back from parental leave? 
So I can say that certainly that's that's certainly one that's very important. I certainly would agree with that. Uh, I can't say that it's been brought recently, okay. but that's certainly uh, a request or a topic that we can certainly explore now. Okay, thank you. And so just as a follow-up to that, you know, sometimes at this time of year, we'll hear ideas or suggestions, someone might bring up a question. Again, this isn't the first time I think that we've heard about like the lactation room or you know, I've had questions just through the year that I've talked to Mr. Strickland about where someone has asked me about lights or our kitchens. You know, well, why do we use throwaway trays? Why don't we wash the trays? Well, because we have a lot of schools that don't have dishwashers anymore, right? But when you talk about the process and the timeline, how are material changes actually recommended or submitted? Is there a formal procedure? If should someone, if there's someone that comes from like a school and has a suggestion, should we direct them to somebody on staff? Or when constituents or part of the school community ask about this, what should we do with those suggestions to officially submit them? I think certainly a good place to start with that would either be myself or Mr. Strickland, and then you know we'll make sure that that uh, gets to the appropriate individual and we can address the request. That's my only question. Okay, thank you. Let's call her. Mr. Strickland, Jeff Well, I was just going to add, uh, after our schools are built, um, a lot of staff people go out and evaluate the buildings, um, maintenance and operations, academics. A lot of people go out and look at the buildings. And from those visits, um, they generate these same requests that, of things that we may need to change that we would incorporate. Um, I had not heard the one that you uh, came up with, but we can certainly yeah. and figure out a way to include that in future work. Yeah, and I just saw, I mean, it just came top of mind because I saw a, a PTA that had created one for their school using PTA funds, and I thought, well, is that something that we can incorporate into new buildings or renovate it, you know, tear down, rebuild? Um, to just have it a part of our program assumptions, and it and it would be it would be a sort of a dual modality thing because they're required to be available. Schools have to figure it out, but whether or not it's built into program assumptions, and then assessing what existing schools are doing or can do to ensure some parity there is important also. And just because we're talking about how ideas are reviewed or submitted doesn't mean that just because someone has an idea that we can do it or we would do it, that it would be cost effective. I just want to temper everyone's expectations there. Um, all right. It's um, been seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Caulfield. Um, I just, I saw it in the presentation, I believe it was on uh, slide nine, Lakes. What is that? Steve? Those are our learning environment guidelines, and the legs are also uh, something that we're paying close attention to. Uh, it's not something that's formally updated every year, but it is something that we're looking <coughs> to do this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to ask like that. A, she'd like an example <laughs> of what a leg would be. Like that collaborative like collaborative spaces? I mean, more yeah. puppies right. in a so kindergarten like when you classroom? Go, sure. So like when you're in our elementary schools mm -hmm. and you'll see uh, perhaps you're walking down a classroom corridor and uh, every three or four classrooms you'll have an open collaboration area where a teacher can take a smaller group out of their classroom, go out, uh, perhaps they're teaching a lesson or um, some of the kids are able to go in a smaller group and come out and, and do independent study, something along those lines. Okay. And I guess that actually, uh, without knowing it, went to one of my next questions, suggestions, I don't know, but along the lines of uh, having the lactation rooms, um, one of the things that I saw while I was going around are, especially in the restart uh, schools that we had, they had like a place um, that they either converted um, PTA, you know, put their input in, and the, like the rooms were really dark, they had lava Sensory lamps, rooms. I love it. I mean, they had, um, you know, the seats that come out and hang, and I mean, if you have a child with special needs, you totally know how much that changes their world in a split second. 
Um, so I think if our schools were able to incorporate that somewhere along the lines, just having those spaces, and it doesn't have to be huge. I mean, I saw one that was a music room that was converted into a space. It was huge. It didn't need to be that, but they, that's what they use because they use a different space for um, music now, so they just converted that space. I also saw uh, some other classrooms that were much smaller, but they did that. They put curtains. They had, you know, it was darker. They had the LED lamps, and it just kind of converted the space into what they could use to help these children. And they would bring them there, whether they were having, you know, a difficult time or they needed to remove them from the element they were in to kind of diffuse the situation. Either way, I, I didn't want to leave the room, so <laughs> you know, I could see how that would definitely help. Um, if they were able to incorporate that. Thank you. Sponsor the seventh. Is that good? All right, Mr. Hershey. Um, two things. Why did um, it said they deleted the language uh, about existing campuses will be reviewed to determine ability and need to add capacity? Why was that? It was moved to a different section. Okay. And which is also in the backup document. Got it. Okay. That's fine. And if we're throwing out uh, ideas, then I'm sure all officials would love to have to not change um, in locker rooms or closets. Uh, not that Wake County is particularly bad at this, but um, there's... Oh, you mean referees. Sorry. Yeah. Is yes. That what Athletic about? officials. Whether it's football yes. or and only at high schools, because at, at middle school we tend to show up dressed, but at high schools you're in locker rooms. Um, those showers can be not pleasant to use, um, and I'm sure it extends for basketball officials and uh, other officials that change, wrestling officials that change at schools. There are um, great facilities for that. And we don't need a lot. I never thought of that, not being, you know, oh, yeah. ever it's, having it, been a... We've been, I mean, you go around the 11 counties that we get, we are in closets, you're in uh, old, where they, they're storing old athletic gear, and it, some are nicer than others, and some are not, you just can't wait to change and get out. Well, because it, cause it would be accurate to say that no, I, there, I can't think of any school system that builds athletic facilities with specific space for um, officials or referees in mind, but officials and referees uh, don't want to change in the same room as a team might be changing, right. and so that's why they end up in a closet somewhere, because the, the choice becomes space that's made for that or private space. and. Um, and so they kind of go back and forth on it. But it is, it is something that came up in a recent <coughs> survey of officials uh, in terms of things that, that could be helpful that schools could have in place that, um, because we have a shortage of officials. Oh, so. <laughs> and it, can be, it doesn't have to be a different place for football officials versus basketball yeah, officials, just, you know, just so people understand. Yep. Um, yes. Mr. Swanson, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, just thought of me, but some of these collaborative spaces, I know that locker rooms are typically obsolete now in most high schools, probably middle schools too. So are, they, are there any consideration of turning those spaces into some collaborative spaces? I've um, seen Greenhope has turned some of theirs, which is a great space for students to collaborate, to eat lunch there, but I think of some of these other schools who may be a little older, who does not necessarily have some of these collaborative spaces. Is that a possibility that we could utilize to that's a facility modification form. <laughs> and part of the four seeds grant? Well, we, so we, Sometimes. that was a few years ago. We, we did that a few years ago. Okay. We gave, um, we let schools apply. We had funding available for 30 or 40 schools to apply to use funds to create exactly those spaces. Um, a lot of schools in the past few years have filled out a facility modification request to eliminate some of the lockers in their buildings because they don't use them. But it really depends on where those lockers are, whether or not it actually helps with creating space or collaborative space. Like if you have if you have those half lockers that are tabletop, right. that's great collaborative space that you can use whether you remove the lockers or not. But if all your lockers in our building are against the walls, 
removing them doesn't actually create, it creates a wider hallway, but it doesn't actually create space that you might want to use for collaborative space. It just, it depends. But it is something that principals have some access and um, initiative that they can take upon requesting what it is they may want to do. And it goes in as a, a fact mod, I believe it would go in. Does that make sense? Smart would be a fact mod. I think ever since I've been on the board, we continually reduce the number of lockers have, in our high schools. We no longer have one locker per student at a high school capacity. They just don't use them. Middle schools. <laughs> middle middle like school is really more. big on sixth grade because now they're big sixth graders and they want to use them and it's a really big different thing. <laughs> but by the time they're eighth graders, they're not using them anymore. All right, um, just one follow-up, and I, I do need some clarification, and this gets to a point that Mr. Hershey raised. The section, I think it's on page 8 of the, um, the backup document, the draft assumptions, yeah. that section, um, the original language, WCPSS will conduct a facility assessment on the total permanent square footage each year. Mm -hmm. And we explained that you don't need to do the permanent square footage, it just needs to be a portion of it, but it's a portion of one-seventh of the school facilities each year. Yes. Can you explain that? I mean, is that taking all of our schools, dividing them by seven, and only getting a seventh assessed each year? Or, or what is that? And is that a different assessment than the one we talked about earlier, where we said we would do it like maybe every three it years? Is. It okay. is, because when the consultant was hired, the consultant was specifically hired to look at our 55 oldest uh, schools in this district. Okay. And they were assessing the condition of the schools, mm -hmm. Uh, also the safety mm -hmm. on those campuses mm -hmm. and really drilled down and did an extensive analysis to determine what, where we were presently mm -hmm. and how we could then form our top 25, okay. as you know. And, and so for context, you know, if you're just looking at this, you think, well, gosh, we should assess everything, every school, every year. Yeah. How involved a process is this? Like how much does it take in terms of staff or manpowers or expense? I don't know, but I think we don't have the manpower to do it. So I'm going to too yeah, large. I, I, yeah, I, so I'm going to say that there are some things that are done every year. There are some things that are done for one seventh of our schools. And then there are some things like the 55 oldest building that was done through a special project. And, it, and because some things you have to check every year, filters or you know other things that, that have to be done you know, like even quarterly, multiple times a year. Um, but there are some things, and it's the, the level of what you're looking at increases um, as the frequency decreases, <laughs> right? So I, I know we run like a very lean operation, a leaner than maybe what the standard should be. And I just don't know if this is an area where because we're so lean, we can't assess as, as often as maybe we should. It's just we assess as much as we can. I think it's fair to say that we assess as much as we can. Let's be clear about the, the schools, the 55 schools. They were our 55 schools with square footage that was 30 years old or older at the time. Obviously, the assessment uh, was completed in the fall of 21. So, you know, we may have added a school or two since then. They were the, typically the oldest schools. And typically, oldest schools are the ones with the greatest need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. All right. Thank you. Did anyone else have any other questions? Any final questions? All right. If not, Douglas, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we had done in previous years at the end of facilities is that if we had new business, if we would have um, you know, certain issues of concern that we wanted to bring up, we'd have to save a little bit of time at the end to introduce those. Um, and that's a little bit different than the next item, which is the facilities three-month forecast. The three-month forecast is sort of our way of telling you what's coming up. So you can see, you know, we have a lot of very calendar-driven tasks, uh, a lot of it to deal with the budget. A lot of our capital planning is based on capital budgeting, bonds. So you'll see all of this here, and we'll run through all of these. But then, so the difference is that I guess the, the, the forecast are a lot of the items that we have to do. Are there construction projects coming up, design 
plans that might be brought in for review in addition to the budget, whereas new business would be if you have a certain topic that you'd like us to talk about to get on the agenda. Um, Sam and I as chair and vice chair will meet with staff, so if you Today's not your only shot, so if you have an idea that you'd like to see considered, just let either one of us know, and then we have a planning meeting. We'll bring it up, talk to staff about the issues, see if it's something that just can be satisfied with like a staff answer or conversation, or if it's something that you know is something we should dedicate some time in a meeting and really get like a deeper explanation of it. And it may be worthwhile to note for the newer members, we typically meet on the Wednesday between those that first and third. Um, Board meetings. Yeah, board meetings. So we meet in between, but because of the calendar for this time, we're going to push it to the end of the month. Yeah. Okay. Well, do those. Want, do you want, want to, to talk? Do, do you want to do new business first? Before well, we I was just I was just bringing that up since this okay. is your first meeting. I don't know if we came with a lot of ideas. Sure. But Chair Mahaffey. I just wanted to say, um, just so it's on the record, and I'll share this with everybody. The underlie underutilized year round schools was discussed at the January 18th, 2022 work session, and then voted on at the February 1st board meeting. So um, that would be in that YouTube for the work session. For the moving uh, year round to a mm -hmm. single track, okay. yeah, and that would be specific to you know Westlake and all of those mm -hmm. schools that moved. So you're, yeah. Okay. Okay. And like I said, sometimes there might be a specific question someone asks you about. Um, Ms. Evans had mentioned uh, like Swift Creek, and someone today had asked me what's going on with the move. But that's something that we could do it as a meeting item, but it's probably something we just email staff and get a response back to constituents or things like that. Um, but if anyone has like a pressing issue or, or something, Sam, do you want to do a pressing, pressing issue? issue? I just want to thank uh, Mark um, that, and this is for the public to know that uh, no, new builds have the capacity now to be built solar ready. That's new for the Wake County Public School System. Doesn't mean they're all going to have solar panels on top of them, but now uh, they've worked with Wake County and, and I think Wake County Commissioners actually for doing it, uh, for going first. They're going to have some solar on some of their new builds. So I know there are a lot of um, constituents and staff that are very interested in sustainability and energy. And it's a good first step, and I want to congratulate. I always like to point out, even if it's a small step, it's a good step, and it deserves recognition. Right. So I appreciate Mark and the staff doing that. Excellent. That's okay. good. Anything else for new business? All right, if not, uh, that right. takes through the yes. uh, three-month forecast. All right, so from top to bottom, obviously you'll see where we were today, what we covered today, and then we move down into our first board meeting of February, and you'll see the items uh, that are on there. If you see cross-outs, uh, those were items that were on there initially that have been moved to a later meeting for whatever that particular reason might be. Of particular note, coming up on February 7th would be GMP number two for Bauckham Elementary School, and then we've got GMP three and reconciliation of GMP. GMP2 for Felton Grove High School. And can you can you tell us what GMP means? Yes. So when we talk about uh, our contractors' contracts, um, it is the contract vehicle uh, that is used at the CMR, the contractors that are working at risk. Um, it is what we use in our industry um, for um, uh, for their contract for the financial aspect of the project. And so in the large projects, what you'll see is that there are multiple GMPs because what happens what does is... What GMP stand for? Let's, can we start with that? Sorry. sorry. Like guaranteed maximum guaranteed price. Guaranteed maximum yes. price. Yes, sorry. Um, we bid multiple <laughs> times. and. and it, this is actually a great question because right now, because of the environment that we're in right now, we're finding that we need to go out to bid multiple times depending on certain trades, okay? Um, GMP number one is typically the pre-construction, which is the very beginning of a project, which allows, uh, and it's not a significant amount of money, but it's enough to get the project started, allows the contractor to get going. Um, and then as you move beyond GMP number one and then move down the road to two and three and so on, what you're seeing is the progression of the trades. And when I say the trades, electrical, mechanical, structural, roofing, etc. as those bids 
submissions are being finalized and we have those numbers, then we are bringing them to you all formally to approve that portion of the contract or the guaranteed maximum price. I think it's worthwhile to note that we almost exclusively use the CMF risk model. Um, back in the old days, you would bid everything out and, and prime contractors would come in, in nowadays. The market has driven just about everybody to CMF risk, where a general contractor comes in and is responsible for all of the trades under that one single umbrella. And so they are our single point of contact for everything associated with the project. Another thing I do that's, that's important to note that you're probably going to see some of are that because of the market volatility that we're facing right now and the long lead for some of our trades in our supply chain, you will see that we're doing in some cases what we're calling early release packages, meaning like, for instance, electrical or mechanical, which we used to be able to get in a much quicker turnaround, is now sometimes taking up to a year to get. So as soon as we have good legitimate pricing, it's been vetted and we're ready to bring it to you, we're saying, look, we need to do it in this fashion in order to hold the schedule. So that's what an early release package means, if you see that. Okay. Um, then we will move down to February, so we will be back with you all February 15th. Um, it's important to note that, of course, we're normally with you every four weeks. This is a quicker turnaround. It'll be three weeks because we met later this month. Okay. Then we move on to uh, the second board meeting in February, and a, a particular there you go. Um, a particular note on that one would be uh, GMP number one for Pleasant Plains Elementary School, and also GMP number one for Rex Road Elementary School. Uh, as we continue down. <coughs> go to our March facilities, and that was referenced this afternoon. So that's one item at this point that we have on the schedule to bring to you all at that meeting. And then we'll move down a little bit further to April. So generally speaking, the, the, the game plan would be to bring you various parts and pieces of the capital improvement plan throughout the course of the spring. And then we would come back in April for the April meeting. We would do a review of everything that we brought to you to that point, ask if there's any additional feedback or comment at that point. If the answer is no and we're good, then we would be seeking the, the thumbs up from you all then to take it to board work session formally at the next opportunity to bring that up for full board approval. Any questions? Any questions? All right, well that concludes our formal agenda. Thanks everybody for coming. You've got a few more minutes. Uh, you get out a few minutes early, a little bit of a break. So we'll call this meeting adjourned. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.